this is the, uh, I, uh, the, this meet is organized by uh, International Water Management uh, Institute. So if you look at the picture, some interventions have helped. For example, irrigation does help to increase farmers' income. But by itself, irrigation, I mean, unless you, if you're considering subsistence, then yes, irrigation does help ensure subsistence and something more than subsistence. But if you're talking about prosperity, like farmers being able to send their kids to private schools, something that they aspire to, being able to buy private health care, something they aspire to, to have a motorbike, income in the range of $5,000 per hectare. Uh, if that's, that's your benchmark or something even less than that, then irrigation by itself and a lot of other things that uh, governments, NGOs, and um, research institutions have been focusing on uh, is grossly inadequate, uh, is what I would say. This is a quote, this is, I love Urdu poetry, so here's a quote from Muhammad Iqbal, who's a famous poet. He said, This khet se dhahkaan ke maya sarn hirozi, us khet ke har ko sa hai gindum ko jala do. Meaning, uh, a farm that cannot ensure livelihood, basic livelihood for, for the farmers, just burn the, all the crop that is grown there. My call is much less revolutionary. I am not uh, making a call to burn anything down. His fortunate favorite from all the case studies that we have collected, he is a small farmer in Jharkhand uh, uh, where Pradhan works. He started small and uh, started growing vegetables, made, uh, started making a lot of money, but he was not satisfied with whatever he was making. So he started bringing in other farmers. He had developed skills and aptitude for it. So he started bringing in other farmers in from his village and formed partnerships, informal partnerships with them so that he could expand the area, bring in more capital and take the whole enterprise to the next level. Three, four years down the line, those farmers had picked up those skills and they started forming their own partnership. So he had, not only he got himself rich, but he had a replication mechanism too. Not, he was not intending to expand this practice. He was just helping himself and in the process, he, he helped see a whole cluster of innovative farmers, farmers who got very rich. Similarly, Professor Palsin from IIM Ahmedabad yesterday presented this amazing case study of ginger growers in Maharashtra who made up to 2 million rupees per hectare of land in a year or over a period of 20 months. So there are several uh, examples. Sneha presented different, uh, four different case studies from different parts of Gujarat where farmers regularly make through potato, green potato or backyard poultry make more than $5,000 uh, in a year. <laughs> Tamil Nadu e-extension team, the agriculture university team, they have uh, set up a cluster uh, where farmers are producing fruits, bananas in this case, for export and they are making up to 500,000, 6, uh, 600,000 rupees a hectare. So there are a number of, these are just a few of a large number of examples that exist uh, in our country. And what we wanted to do is that we are, we are asking three broad sets of questions. What is it that these breakout examples of individuals and clusters, what is it that they are doing different? What is it that they are doing differently? What different strategies are they adopting? What are the different practices that they do? And I there are some individual qualities or contextual qualities that what are those? We are trying to get a sense of that. The second is, which we think is very important, is what kind of institutional arrangements and infrastructure do help such farmers emerge and replicate? Huh? And third is, which is probably the most important question, which is the point behind the whole exercise, is how do we make these exceptions rule? How do we mainstream their success? That's the third point that we are interested in asking. If I look at the case studies that, that were presented yesterday, the three broad sets of the three broad classes of case studies. There are examples of individual farmers. Incidentally, just a coincidence, I guess, or maybe there is some pattern, that all the case studies that we got from NGOs and uh, grant makers like SRTT and SDTT were of individual brilliance. Somehow, it might be just coincidence. When Tushar sent out his concept note, he had an explicit request to also look for cohorts or clusters of villages. It so happened that all the case studies that we got from our NGO uh, partners were all of individual farmers, islands of super, superior performance. Uh, it will be interesting to see if uh, when we expand and we get more case studies in this process, is it so that the people who are working in NGOs are more interested in understanding how individuals break out? I do not know. I won't go into the, that. But these are farmers who either through their own initiative or through initial support from an NGO or agribusiness did very well. The key question, we have these case studies and I think we should look at them. Uh, the key question is that what can we learn from, this is the question for, from each three class case studies. And for me what is the most interesting question, the two questions. One is what, what is it, what are the qualities in them that we can, we can in, uh, inculcate or imbibe even in other farmers. Huh? If you believe that entrepreneurship is not always born, you can train it. There is a whole entrepreneurship development institute not far from here. Uh, so, 
How can we, what can we learn from them? How can we transplant them to others? The even more important question for me personally that I find is why aren't there, these are individual examples, clearly established, clearly visible. Why aren't there neighbors copying them? Why aren't they being emulated? I think understanding that would also help us in understanding the barriers for that, that these farms face in succeeding. The second half is spontaneous cohorts, so Swayamgu cohorts as I, uh, as I say that. There is groups, whole villages or groups of villages that are doing one thing or two things, uh, basically producing some commodity for the market. And what I found interesting is that the examples of such clusters, even in areas that are known for their deep underdevelopment, like Jharkhand or Orissa, and even not, I'm not talking about the coastal Orissa, but that doesn't work so much in coastal Orissa. Like areas that are deeply underdeveloped, they're the most underdeveloped, you see such clusters emerging even, even in such adversity. So they, the first question, the first obvious question, how did these clusters emerge? I think learning this process, just documenting the process in an analytical way and learning from it can go a long way. What can we learn from them? We all NGOs or livelihood programs, whether from government or other agencies, trying to create such clusters, trying to bring prosperity, or that's what they should try, I believe. So how, what can we learn? Because they emerge themselves, huh? without these expensive, long-term interventions. So what can we learn? What are the elements of their success that could be brought in into the seeded interventions where when we are making deliberate efforts to create such clusters? And another question is, even these clusters, so if, what, if Uttar Sandha emerged as a paper manufacturing hub, why didn't other villages Nearby, near the person, why did it took 40 years for another one to emerge in uh, Anand? So even for these automatic clusters, why don't we see more of them being copied? What stops them? What stops from other centers emerging nearby? Why don't these clusters grow? Is, is my question. Why, what puts a limit on their size? What, puts the, what are the limits to growth? And then there are cohorts that were built with deliberate external uh, support, external intervention. A very good example was what Dr. E. Vadivel from TNA presented. And the biggest example of this is Operation Flood. Huh? And that if, I mean, this is a very crude kind of typology. You can have nuances in them. So the Operation Flood was a deliberate effort by IDDB, by Dr. Korean, to create uh, successful clusters of dairy producers all across India. So there the key question is, a lot of NGOs and sometimes even government institutions work very closely with uh, villages and village communities to create new clusters. Can, is there a way? that we can substitute this need for intense engagement every time. I can understand when you, are, you have to create the first few examples and then I would hope that they, they replicate themselves. But the seeded clusters, there are some examples like Operation Flood where they, they, they spread pretty fast. But is there a way that we can substitute for the need for intense engagement every time with some blueprint or some design elements that would make the replication easier, faster, more efficient? And if that is, I know that I am citing Operation Flood, but to create an Operation Flood, huge amount of resources were required. This institution was built to support and sustain Operation Flood, and many such institutions in this whole area. So if, if that is what we are looking for, then I think it would be good to have a sense of what, is, what are the resource requirements in terms of human resources, capital, engagement with policy, what kind of uh, resources would be required to have fast uh, uh, spread of such uh, interventions. Just after having said the four of the questions that, uh, the broad questions, I will just summarize the broad patterns that emerged from these case studies and our discussions yesterday. The first is that land has become much less important in value creation. It is still central, it's still, but it's not the locus of value creation anymore. The, the raw product comes from land, but it has been replaced by other resources. Yeah? But all the case studies that we had yesterday, there were case studies of farmers that were one hectare, one to two hectares. Many, many plots are much smaller. So whatever the strategy that we are thinking, and there were both kinds of opinion in the session yesterday. Could a small half acre farmer, acre farmer in Bihar, in West Bengal, in Kerala also adapt to the strategies, engage with the market, whatever is required to become prosperous? Is that, uh, is that possible? Can we do it in that way? That's one question that comes to my mind. Second is that all our examples, water control and not irrigation. Water control is a prerequisite to this kind of farming that we are talking about, high value farming. We couldn't get even a single example of farmer who is solely dependent on surface irrigation and could shift to this high intensity multiple crop uh, kind of farming. So water control is necessary. But as I said in the beginning, it's necessary but far from sufficient. 
There are a lot of farmers who have very good access to water and are doing very, very subsistence kind of farming or barely making some money. So, the, but given that, that water control is essential, you cannot do, you can't even start thinking about it uh, without having some sort of water control. The question is, only one third of India's uh, next zone area is irrigated and we are already hitting problems of water scarcity in large parts of the country. So, then how do you expand it? And are there any scalable, non-water intensive strategies that would make, that would allow, that would keep this dream open for millions of small farmers in India? Third thing which is clear, very clear is the cereals cannot lead to prosperity. India's cereal yields of the rice wheat system is about 6 tons, even in the rich areas or 8 tons. Even with 10 tons, even if you go to Australia's level of paddy yields, it won't, for this farmer, their plots are so small, given the time it takes to grow a cereal, you are not going to get prosperous. But if you move to these other high value products, there is high risk, production and price, there is intermediate support price from government, uh, insurance mechanisms from private and public sources are poor, and probably these are the difficulties that you see, you see so few examples of individual or cluster success. Huh? So the question would be, how do you mitigate risks? Huh? Crop or weather insurance hasn't taken off. Contract farming, I'll come to, uh, we had uh, this discussion on contract farming yesterday, thanks to Professor Pal Singh. So, what are other mechanisms, institutional and individual, uh, that could that would enable farming to avoid risks and if once the negative shock happens to manage it without being burned? How do we avoid the fate of farmers in Vidarbha and AP, the BT cotton growers, how do we avoid it? How do we move farmers to this high value cropping without putting them through that uh, tragedy? Fourth question that emerged yesterday and we had some discussion is if you look at all the, these individual examples of success, they are all doing five, six, eight different kinds of crops. They are trying everything that they can, everything that can fetch money. Partly to cover this, but partly also because they are always on the lookout, uh, they are always scanning the scene to tap new opportunities of making money. On the other hand, if you look at these clusters, then most of these clusters are one or two crop, one or two commodity clusters. Yeah? So, is there a tension between the two? Because if you have too many crops, uh, on one hand it enables you to mitigate risk, uh, manage your working capital requirements, but on the other hand, scaling up becomes difficult because engaging with the market, the cost of price discovery, cost of accessing, the cost of accessing the market, all of that goes up. Agglomerations on the other, and maybe that is the reason why with agglomerations you see specializations and farmers focusing mainly on one or two commodities. Yeah. So the question is, is diversification essential for small farmers to become prosperous? Or similarly on the same lines, is a specialization essential for scaling up? Or could you specialize? Could you scale up even with diversity? Because diversity has other virtues too, without, besides risk covering and it's better for environment and other things. Huh? So, and the third question is that if farmers will continue growing diverse crops, can these new channels of FDI and retail or big retailers and other channels, can they deal with these small farmers growing so many commodities? Can they figure out new institutional arrangements, new, new innovations that would allow them to deal with these large number of small farmers doing a variety of things over a vast countryside? That's the uh, question that hangs. Fifth uh, point is that Small farmers face very high transaction costs and have very little bargaining power in the market. Yeah? So some sort of aggregation is required. Huh? It doesn't have to be formal, it could be informal. Uh, if you look at the formal sorts of uh, aggregation, producer companies and cooperatives, there are very few examples of success. And the new ones that are being promoted, I'm a bit cynical about them. Uh, it seems that the cost of promoting each new one seems to be enormous and then if, even if a successful example is created, it's not being replicated. And there are, there isn't an operation flood parallel in this, in this new space that, that is visible to me uh, actually. So unless someone, I think the burden of proof is on the other side uh, in this thing. So if aggregation mechanisms are not working, the ones that we are trying, the official, the formal ones, then we have to find some way, if you want more farmers to to do market-led, market-oriented farming, then how do we make some of these things tasks easier for them? Are there some ways? Can we leverage technology? Are there other informal ways that we are not looking at and we should make it easier for those informal institutions like we were talking about when the summer presented the informal uh, in, the, in the ship market? So something like that in the, in the market for clean goods too. So, and this is also an important point that my teacher Paul Kogun will be very happy that I am talking about it here. So, Agglomerations, clusters help, 
not only in agriculture, in every other everything where clusters form, uh, efficiency improves, cost of joining the bandwagon goes down. But the challenge is how do clusters emerge? Uh, how do we see new clusters? How do we see create new agglomerates instead of just one or two examples? Because if you look at the history of clusters, they often emerge spontaneously. And if you look at the history of trying to see new clusters, there's a long list of failures. Yeah? In every sector, it's not just about agriculture. Look at the IT parks in every capital. Yeah? Even Gujarat is succeeds, government in Gujarat succeeds in almost everything. Its technology park is a dud, at least thus far. Kolkata, Patna, you go, you see, I mean, you go to a place and they are not uh, succeeding. So, this, the history of planners, the planners haven't been great in bringing one up. Most of them have emerged spontaneously. So, how do we change that? We need to change that. We need to learn and do a better job of being able to see clusters. How do we do that? My point is that if you look at it, I, I mean, I work on currently I'm with IFP and I work on a project which aims to bring agriculture research down to farmers faster. Yeah? But if you look at the applications, and while I'm working on it, I'm trying to, I'm supposed to come up with new business models and whatnot. Look at the example. There's many examples of replication, things that are of obvious benefits that take a frustratingly slow to spread. And on the other hand, there are other things that are spread even without us realizing it. Be it water market as an institution, or BT cotton as a crop. And there are many, many examples who are seeds, price signal to show very rapid spread. So there's some things that spread very slowly, but there are counter examples that are spread very fast. What can we learn from these spontaneously spreading institutions, spontaneously spreading crops and commodities, spontaneously spreading practices? What can we learn? Also, what can we learn from success stories of things that didn't scale up? There's some that remain limited scale up. I think there's some lessons to be drawn from there too. And third thing that is, I think, important for all is not only for a spread of clusters, but I think it's of both academic and uh, practical interests. How do, when do people learn from each other and when do they not? Huh? Agriculture has been around for 5,000 years. There are a lot of things. When do they learn by doing? How does the learning by doing happen? How does learning by seeing happen? I think this is very important to crack open that uh, mechanism, to open that black box. We know that learning does happen and sometimes it happens very slowly. How do we speed up the process of learning by seeing? How do we speed up the process of learning by doing? I think that's a, that's a fundamental question too, but it's also of uh, very high applied uh, interest. The tenth question is, the tenth question that I'm posing is almost a duality, is that which one of the two models is better? Extensive effort or intensive? So some of the two models. There's some NGOs that work closely with a small group of farmers on a number of track aspects for a large number of things. Like Sadhguru is an example, and let's say if you take water harvesting or uh, uh, lift irrigation as a model. There are others that just spread fast and do not do such a deep, thorough job. Huh? So as for a child movement would be one of them. I'm not saying one is better than another. No, that's not my claim. Huh? I wish that also was here. Uh, the question is, under what conditions would one model be better than others? Can we have some discussion on that? And what kind of changes do we need to make in each of the models? The merits and demerits of both models, right? So Rastra Child Movement did well, but there are several problems uh, that many people sitting here can tell you in detail. So what kind of changes could we make in both these models to make them more successful, to make them better? Last, uh, Sir, we have two more minutes. Oh, really? Yes. I am going to take some more time. Oh, no. yeah. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> we have 25 minutes already. Yes. Ah. Ah. So the last, I'll skip this slide in that case. The other thing that came out from our discussion yesterday is both government and private corporations have disappointed us. Government focuses more on food security. Uh, so, but in that case, I think there are some government programs that have worked. I think what is it that we can learn from programs and policies that have delivered for small farmers? And how can we make the existing programs, this is the point that Manas brought out, better, work better for small farmers? Narega, National Railroad Mission, RKBI, private businesses, uh, the news was disappointing in this study discussion. Have vested interest in small farmers doing better, but haven't engaged in a meaningful way, in a long term way. There are some exceptions, like the case study that Sneha did. So, contract farming is an institution promised great hope, but has ended up being contract farming. They will, they're not, the, the companies are not covering the risk of uh, farmers. So, the question is, are there regulatory policies to blame that we are not seeing meaningful, symbiotic kind of uh, relationship between agribusinesses and farmers? 
And I mean, in this, if there are such uh, problems, and are there any low-hanging fruits? I'm not talking of changing the whole policy landscape, but are there any low-hanging fruits which we can grab and make other things better? The last few slides, the library programs that we see by government or by NGOs, most of them seem to target subsistence, not prosperity. Yeah? So question that I want to pose to NGOs and donors, and others, is it time for NGOs and donors to rethink their library strategies and programs? And if it is, yeah, what should be the design elements of a livelihood program that seeks to make a large number of farmers prosperous? Now, I should uh, synthesize last. So yesterday, if, you, if I just summarize one slide summary of the yesterday discussion. First thing that everyone emphasizes that we need to shift, there's a need for shift in focus from just farm to the whole value chain. To do that, if, you, if you're doing that, the land becomes much less important. Water control is essential but not sufficient. And if you're dealing with small farmers, then some sort of aggregation, both at the input and the output level, both uh, ends of supply chain is needed. And there are different institutional elements that already exist. The question there would be that what kind of institution, there are some uh, institutional elements like Mahagreeps and others that seem to be working. How can we replicate those institutional elements? Finally, just last two slides, like I have some questions. I know that this, this is not the job of just NGOs and donors. Uh, government is involved and researchers are involved, but I have a set of questions that I want to engage NGOs with in a research program or just a program of reflection. Is it the first question that I have to the NGOs? Like they are working like, can we be more ambitious? And I'm not talking about the ambition of Jatayu, Sampati, or Ikaras, but can we be more ambitious than the fatalism of dollar two a day? Because if you talk to youngsters today, they're not interested in development program that's, which would ensure this time. And if so, what are the changes it would require uh, in the, the way you design programs? Yeah? I understand that the NGOs, a lot of development organizations work in very, very poor areas. So ensuring subsistence is required, at least as a first step. But are there any trade-offs? I'm sure there are. What are the trade-offs in working for subsistence and working for prosperity? Huh? If, if you change the goal, if you move the milestones, what are the trade-offs? What is it that we're going to lose? What are the risks involved? That's something that I want to understand. I think I, it would be very, I am very happy there in it. Another thing that came out a lot in our discussions yesterday is that there's a need for long-term engagement. NGOs to make, whenever, or any intervention institution that is working at grassroots to bring prosperity, it has to have a staying power and it needs to have long-term engagement. I understand that. But does long-term engagement lead to prosperity with the design that you're doing? Or does it even prepare these people that they will take off by themselves? That's a question I I also understand that this long-term engagement would be needed. But, okay, you create, by your, let's assume that your, the long-term engagement does create prosperity, at least in some pockets. But then what is, do you go in, what is the model of replication that you go in with? I can understand that you want to see some success stories, but there has to be some model, a priori model that, that would ensure that after the some success stories are seeded, it would spread. So what is the model of self-replication? And then I would bring Dr. Kurian and this Dr. Kurian for our colloquium. Is it Operation Flood, uh, something that I was taught here at Edmar? It also spread fast, and there was some initial engagement, but the initial engagement was not that long term. So how did Operation Flood manage it? What were the special characteristics? There are a number of case studies on why it succeeded and what I draw it. But can we learn some lessons from such programs that are spread rapidly for the NGO programs that are being implemented? And this is, I just put a high in research because I'm not proposing a research agenda, but there's some reflections that I think would be, would be great uh, from my perspective, and you can disagree. So there's some NGOs here which are very famous, they have done a great job and have long-term presence, okay? So let's look at the earliest interventions the ones that you made in the early phase of uh, your uh, for existence, and which were moderate success. Huh? Are those areas where you have worked for 20, 25 years, where you have created long-term engagement, are those areas, those areas, farmers and those are moving towards prosperity? You ensured subsistence, more than subsistence in those areas, but did they acquire the capability to move, to move on a trajectory of prosperity by themselves now that you're working in other areas? Have they acquired the ability, has that worked, the model that you're going with, that will empower them to the level from where they can take off by themselves? Are they moving towards this prosperity? Let's pick so those case studies and see how they are doing compared to the neighboring villages where you didn't intervene. Are they doing two times better or three times better than the neighboring ones? If yes, can we speed up the process? Huh? If there are some pockets where you work and where farmers are on their path to prosperity, then the process of creating other such clusters, can we speed up the process? If not, if those areas are also not moving towards prosperity, are still just at 
subsistence plus levels, then what is it that is missing in those earlier interventions and what can we change that that that, that will speed up? Another, this is in my last slide, I think, is the exploring the limits of success. Let's revisit the most successful interventions that some of these very uh, these great NGOs have made. Where they copy? So suppose this pocket was a, suppose over was a success. Was it copied by others, either autonomously or with some hand holding by you, by the uh, organizations concerned? Yeah? Let's say that it was, that with some hand holding the success did spread, did replicate. But even then, my understanding is that creating a second success, creating a third success takes almost just as much time as the first one does, or did. So the question that I want to pose is, are you learning by doing? The institutions, like once you have, have a model, of, you have created a success story, are you creating some sorts of blueprints? Uh, what is your model of learning by doing? Are you learning from what you have done? I'm sure you are. I have no doubt about that, that there is some learning. Can we speed up that process? What would it take? And to what extent? The last point here is, let's say the five crore farmers, in, uh, five crore, Gujarat population is five crore, let's say half of them are farmers, that's 2.5 crores. What would it take uh, to make 1% of small farmers, that would be around, let's say, 3 lakh farmers, prosperous in next five years or next three years? Can, and this is focused mostly to NGOs because they are here in this room. Like, could you develop a program and a model jointly or independently that in the next, or uh, whatever area you are working in, the pockets of Gujarat, can you have this target? Is that achievable given your current model? that you will convert, you will be able to convert 1% of small farmers into pros prosperous farmers in a given time. Thank you. That's what I close with. I'm sorry I took more time. Thank you, Abhinash. Uh, can you keep the presentation open, actually? Uh, and I think uh, if you can keep it uh, towards the last two, three slides, uh, in particular the one with questions. Uh, Are you sure there are legitimate questions? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, just keep that open and then the 